Greetings, friends, and welcome to this, our Parktown North service, where we round up our preaching series on freedom from fear and justice. And this morning, we are very excited to have the Reverend Christopher Harrison uh, lead us in worship. Uh, Chris is well known to our community and so needs no elaborate uh, introduction. He will guide us through the service and we thank God for the gift that he is to us. We begin as we light our candle of peace, hope, and justice this Sunday. And our prayer is titled, Despair and Hope in a Time of COVID. Come, pray along with me. Almighty God, as we come in all honesty before you, we have to admit that we are weary of lockdown. We are tired of the isolation and loneliness and sometimes despair begins to creep into our lives and take us and take up residence. But then we hear your word again, spoken through your prophet Isaiah. The Lord will not grow tired or weary. He gives strength to the weary. We are tired of the corruption that undermines efforts to bring relief to the poor and to those who are sick. We feel the weariness of our health care workers, but then we hear your word again. Those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not be faint. Help us to hold on to your word, to hold up our heads, to take your outstretched hand and to walk tall with you. Oh God, replace our despair with hope and renew our strength, we pray. Amen. Thank you, friends. We hand over to Chris, who will lead us from now on in the service. Well, good morning, friends, and uh, thank you for the invitation to be a part of you and to share in this particular moment together uh, across the country, uh, far and near, and uh, across the subcontinent for some, and we're just grateful that we can share together. We know that this has been an interesting uh, week as we built up to Sir Roma Pause's statements last night about changing and transitioning uh, to another level. And so I, th I think our topic today is particularly relevant for us to be able to say, what does it mean to be a safe community uh, for today, for tomorrow, but then beyond uh, midnight on Monday night? What does it mean to be safe, not only for uh, those of us who, who are in our circle, but as a country, as a community, and particularly with the vulnerable? How do we cultivate a safe community? So that's really our topic for today. And really grateful for the opportunity to share with you uh, and to wrestle with this wrap up of the series that has been a series that uh, churches across this, uh, the uh, subcontinent in the connection of the Methodist Church have journeyed with together. And so many are preaching on this particular topic today. And uh, if you wish to get a better version of the sermon today, maybe you can fish out on, so on uh, Facebook and find another version uh, if you wish to be enriched by those. Uh, because many will be placing uh, posts on Facebook today in the space. But uh, delightful to see all your faces and to be able to uh, share together. Uh, I love looking at faces and not just names on the screen, because you know that 93% of communication is nonverbal. And so when, uh, when I see your faces, I'm able to understand that uh, God is at work where you are seated, as well as where I am seated. And so thank you for that. Come, let's pray together. Loving God, our Father, 
you have given us permission to call you Father into the safe place of the embrace of your arms. We know that you are the God who holds us, who cares for us, who never leaves us nor forsakes us. You are the God who surrounds us with all that is good, all that is wholesome, and enables us to know that we can depend on you. Thank you for the powerful picture that you've given to us in Jesus, who is the one who translated what it means to be God into our world so that we could understand and touch and feel and experience God with us. Thank you for the incredible intimacy of a relationship with you that we have because of the Holy Spirit within us, that we are able to cry out, Abba, Father, and know in the safety and security of that intimate relationship that we are loved and nurtured, that we belong and have a place. Our lives have significance and meaning because of our connection to you. Therefore, we worship you and we give you glory and honor and praise this day. We give you thanks for your faithfulness, that whenever we have cried out in the name of Jesus, we have trusted that you hear us, for you have told us, ask and you will receive. Anyone who abides in me and I in them, you may ask whatever you wish and it will be granted. And we are grateful that therefore we know we have a God who is not sphinx-like and aloof and indifferent, gazing upon us uh, like a sphinx. We, we have a God who is with us, to whom we connect and belong. Thank you for your faithfulness, your loyalty. Thank you that you are uh, on our side in adversity. But we wish today to confess that there are many times when we have allowed alienation and fear to consume our hearts. And we have distanced male from female, young from old, different cultural uh, backgrounds and races, different geographies to divide. And we confess to you that today we wish to find a united heart around the heart of God. Come Holy Spirit and cleanse our minds and our spirits and our wills so that we may determine to live differently and be empowered to do so by your spirit. For this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen, amen, and amen. So friends, as we uh, come to this particular topic, we're going to dive into uh, some scriptures today. Uh, and Emily's going to read to us. And we, Emily, we're in your hands. Thank you so much, dear. Greetings, children of God. Our first reading comes from Second Chronicles chapter 20, verse 9. And it reads as follows. If calamity comes upon us, whether the sword of judgment or a plague you or a famine, we will stand in your presence before this temple that bears your name and will cry out to you in our distress, and you will hear us and save us. Then our second reading comes from Ezekiel 47, verses 1 to 12, and it reads as follows. The subheading of that passage is the river from the temple. The man brought me back to the entrance of the temple, and I saw water coming out from under the threshold of the temple towards the east, for the temple faced the east. The water was coming down from under the south side of the temple, south of the altar. He then brought me out through the north gate and led me round the outside to the outer gate facing east and the water was flowing from the south side. As the man went west eastward with a measuring line in his hand, he measured off a thousand cubits and then led me through water that was ankle deep. He measured off another thousand cubits and led me through water that was knee deep. He measured off another thousand and led me through water that was up to the waist. He measured off another thousand, but now it was a river that I could not cross because the, the water had risen and was deep enough to swim, to swim in a river that no one could cross. He asked me, son of man, do you see this? Then he led me back to the bank of the river. When I arrived there, I saw a great number of trees on each side of the river. He said to me, this water flows towards the eastern region and goes, in, goes down into the Arabah where it enters the sea. When it empties into the sea, 
the water there becomes fresh. Swarms of living creatures will live wherever the river flows. There will be large numbers of fish because this water flows there and makes the salty, the salty water fresh. So where the river flows, everything will live. Fishermen who stand along the shore, from En Gedi to En Eglaim, there will be places for spreading nets. The fish will be of many kinds, like the fish of the Great Sea. But the swamps and marshes will not become fresh. They will be left for salt. Fruits, fruit trees of all kinds will grow on both banks of the river. Their leaves will not wither, nor will their fruit fa fail. Every month they will bear because the water from the sanctuary flows to them. Their fruit will serve for food and their leaves for healing. This is the word of God. Thank you, Emily, for reading so powerfully. Jehoshaphat and the one passage and then Ezekiel and the other speak to us of God's gracious intervention in our world with life-giving power and grace. And so Paul is going to read to us from Jesus's words from John chapter 7. Thank you, Paul. I, pick up, I take up from verse 37. On the last and most important day of the festival, Jesus stood up and said in a loud voice, whoever is thirsty should come to me and drink. As the scripture says, whoever believes in me, streams of life-giving water will pour out from his heart. Jesus said this about the spirit, which those who believed in him were going to receive. At that time, the spirit had not yet been given because Jesus had not been raised to glory. This is the word of the Lord. Thank you to our readers today for those uh, passages of scripture. I'm going to in, in introduce you now to uh, Haley Walker, uh, who's going to share with us uh, about uh, the ministry that she's been involved with for many, many years. Now, uh, I've been connected with Haley, and we've walked the journey together in ministry and partnership and in different ways. Uh, and uh, we have been able to unpack something what it means to create a ministry where children can follow Jesus. So I'm going to ask if Haley could be unmuted so that we can then hear from her. And I'm going to pose a particular question to her. Uh, what can be done? Now, let me just give a background. Haley now runs a organization that's uh, international, but specifically champion, championing, championing protective behaviors. Uh, within children, within communities, and with churches, and so on, to help children to feel safe. But it's a wider thing in that space. And so here's the question for Haley: What can be done to help children to feel safe and be safe in families and the church? Hi, morning, everyone. Thanks, Chris. Um, that's a, a broad question, and there's a lot that we can do in terms of children and safety. And I think during lockdown, we've become so much more aware of how unsafe our communities really are for children, especially with them not being at schools and things like that. So it makes it even more challenging. I think there's three threefold for the church in terms of keeping kids safe, helping them to feel safe. And the first one is for churches to have proper safeguarding policies and procedures in place. Um, often churches want to trust that everybody who's on their property and comes to them is a safe person for all people. And unfortunately, that's not always the case. So proper policies, procedures, screening of all adults that work with children and working around the legislations in that. A church that is welcoming of ch children, a church that includes children in services, a church that's willing to have tough conversations, I think, but more importantly, a church that's non-judgmental with children and that believes them regardless of what they say is critical if we want to, as a church, be a church that's welcoming and open to children. I think the second thing is the theology of the church, um, looking at the role of children in theology and uh, being clear about what we believe about children and their role in society solid curriculums in the children's ministry. Kids often get confused when ch churches don't have solid curriculum, kind of the Sunday schools left to do their own thing. And then addressing patriarchy in our theology is critical in terms of dealing with gender-based violence and, and violence against children. I think the last one, and probably for me, the, the one I'm most passionate about is parenting and how the church comes alongside parents and equips parents 
we're not trying to parent children for the same world that existed 10 years ago. In fact, we're not even trying to equip children for the same world that existed a year ago. And so parents are kind of dead in the water. The techniques and things that we may have used 20 years ago and even 10 years ago in our parenting is not going to work with children today because of the extent of what they're being exposed to and trying to navigate. And so how do we as the church better equip parents to navigate this new world um, and this new normal for children, online behavior, online risks, which is huge. Um, prevention education is key and the church is well stood in a place to offer prevention education. Um, and so equipping parents with prevention tools, equipping pastors, equipping ministers, equipping those working in the children's ministries with basic skills around prevention. I think the other thing is to offer hope to children rather than fear. So much of what we speak about as parents and as people working with children is fear-based. You know, somebody's going to try and steal you, somebody's going to try and hurt you, and that actually puts our kids at higher risk because it increases anxiety and a whole lot more. So how do we address the hope base of there are things you can do to keep yourself safe, not because the world is out to get you, but so that you can feel confident and equipped when you go into the world. Um, and we really can't discount online for children today. Most of our kids are receiving their education online and they are part of social media and the exposure is huge. Um, just in the last three weeks, I've been on a conference where we've seen a 60% increase in child sexual exploitation online um, across the world. And so we've got to start having those conversations as a church, because if we don't speak about it, who is? And then the last one is, how do we make our, fa our churches family-based? If we want children to feel safe, we need to create happy, healthy families, because that's where the biggest danger is to our children, is within their home environment and their family and community environment. And so as churches, if we start to look at that family base and being more equipped to do events that are family based, we have a better chance of helping children stay safe. Thank you, Hayley. Um, such insightful stuff. It was jam packed with gems. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> And, uh, and, and deeply challenging. And uh, for us in a multi-generational environment, each of us have a role to play within that particular space. Be we yeah. great grandparents or grandparents or parents, or even aunts or uncles, because um, in the Afri African adage, it takes a village to raise a child. Each of us have a particular role and influence in that space. Uh, and so grateful to you for that. Just uh, quickly, if folk want to get hold of you, what's your uh, website and email address? So in terms of protective behaviours, if they want to get hold of me, it's www.pb.org.za. Um, so that's the protective behaviours prevention education. We do programmes for children, we do programmes for parents, and then we do programmes where we train adults to work the programme with children. So it's quite, quite broad in terms of that spectrum. And then in terms of safeguarding and putting proper policies and procedures in place, I have Clayton, which is www.clayton.com. Um, I can put it up in the chat as well, which will make it a bit easier for people. One thing that I've been doing around the country has been uh, working with churches, obviously missionally, but also with the church management system. And, uh, the, you know, we just are within the system and working with Haley to make sure that the management system that you use and others can use uh, has a facility for the certificates for uh, that are police clearance certificates. Uh, for people who work with children within the church and so on. And Haley does workshops around that. So Haley, thank you for your insights uh, yes, in this particular space. So I'm now going to share my screen with you uh, because I want to just uh, give to you a, uh, a particular uh, concept and picture. There we go. The church is a safe place, okay? I want to just uh, sh uh, share a picture with you and see if you remember this particular character, set of characters. Do you remember them? Okay. Tom and Jerry. So I guess the question for us is, uh, you know, is that a, was that a safe place for Tom and Jerry? It seemed to be the home that they lived in was uh, very unsafe. But for 80 years, we've been watching Tom and Jerry chasing each other and uh, causing absolute, uh, absolute havoc within the home environment. Uh, and so it's been very interesting for us to see that. 
Uh, and so safe, uh, safe home, being safe, yes, no. Uh, what is your experience of uh, your home environment and what would make a home safe? Well, this year, on the 16th of April, we saw the death uh, of Jean Deitch, uh, who died at the age of 95. Can you believe that? Uh, and he was the creator of that. Obviously, they took that and put that into animated movies. But that's an era that has come and gone. And we are very aware, therefore, that as we have spoken about families and, and home environment in the church, sometimes it's been a cat and mouse game. Sometimes we are, <laughs> our environment, while it may be humorous, may, it may be um, uh, a, 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 a comic or an animation thing that we watch. The fact is, undergirding that, is sometimes we do not feel safe. Uh, and so what are the things that uh, really makes us feel safe? If safety is the freedom from hurt and harm, if safety is the freedom from hurt and harm, then it is something that uh, some of us uh, need to continue to, uh, to aspire to or look forward to or to uh, pray for. Because even the possibility of hurt, even this possibility of harm uh, causes fear. And we all know that fear and anxiety cause people to pull back and not to be uh, able to live life in its abundance. And so safety comes, it's emotional, it's physical, it's psychological, it's spiritual, all of those kind of dynamics. And so as we talk today, there are three particular things that I'd like to highlight. And the first is the church is an expression of God's love and mystery. The church is, and I'm saying that as a statement of faith and prophecy and hope, that the church is an expression of God's love and mystery. Let's talk about those two words. God is love. Now we all enjoy that particular statement about the nature of God, who God is. When we, when we start with things, we must never start with church. We must always start with God. Because our theology shapes our missiology that shapes our ecclesiology. Who God is shapes what we do and how we do it. And so we need to always look at God. And God's love, God is love, and the Bible tells us that over and over and over again. And what does it mean when we think of God as love? We've got his Father, God as Son, God as Holy Spirit. God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Uh, one God, three persons. And so we are understanding that God is revealing God's self to us in a way that is accessible, as personal. And because God is nurturing and caring, and, and Lee picked up on that last week, the very wider picture of God that is gender unspecific. And so God is a caring, loving, safe God. When we approach God, God listens. God engages. God, in, God is with us, Emmanuel. And so ultimately, we can feel safe because God loves us. That's very important. So the church has been an expression of that by creating hospitals and schools and creches and safety environments and protocols and processes that help people to feel more and more safe. The issues of justice, etc., have been key on the church's agenda. Why? Because the church is an expression of God's love. But also the church, the second part of the dynamic, is an expression of God's mystery. You see, God is also mysterious because God is God. His ways are higher than our ways. His ways are, are, his thoughts are higher than our thoughts. And so we have to live in a world where we understand the miraculous, the unexpected, the mysterious nature of God as well. God is not completely predictable in that sense. And so C.S. Lewis in his writings about the Narnia series depicts Jesus as a lion. I hope you picked that up, and I hope you've watched the series or at least read the books, because Jesus is depicted as a lion. Now, I don't know if when last you went to the bush, uh, but I know that sometime in your life you have experienced a lion close by, and lions are majestic, and they are powerfully magnificent, and you can gaze upon them, but never underestimate that a lion still has a wild side. And so 
as I think C.S. Lewis is trying to allude to us that God is all powerful and yet mysterious and can do the unexpected. And let's be quite clear that when Jesus died, the expected was he would stay in the grave. But God does the unexpected, the mysterious, the miraculous. And that's the nature of God. God is mysterious. And therefore, there is always a desire for us not to think that we can control God because God is loving. Because you are loving, you have to do this for me. God is in the realm of mystery. And therefore, we need to be open to the evolving understanding that we have of this God who is revealing to us new things about himself, God's self. So, in our Chronicles passage, here we find uh, Jehoshaphat finding the world a risky place. So what does Jehoshaphat do? He calls the people to the temple, the place where people experience God's love and mystery. Why? Because the enemies were gathering around. Things were chaotic outside of the, the temple gates. And there was risk, there was uh, stuff that was going to happen that could threaten their lives. But Jehoshaphat called them to the place that we are the most safe, to be open to the miraculous, mysterial, mysterious work of God. And so they were saved because God is love and mystery. And so the church of Jesus Christ is the church that mirrors God's heart. We need to be loving and safe and available and consistent. And the truth is, we were told by in the last uh, three, four months during the pandemic by the South African Council of Churches, that the churches are still the most trusted places and body in the entire country, more trusted than any other organizational or political realm. The church of Jesus Christ continues to be a trusted place, a safe place for people. So that's the first picture. We start with the picture of God and the church that models itself on God. But the second is, we as a church need to be asking for loads of wisdom and great discernment. Why? To continue to build trust. Safety comes when we can trust. When you can trust the church, people will turn to the church more and more. And so we have to be discerning. Why? Because we mustn't be naive. As Haley reminded us, the church is not always a safe place. And some of us have experienced that to a greater or lesser extent. The church is not a safe place sometimes. There's envy and jealousy and there's gossip and backbiting and all those kind of negative things. But the truth is this, we need to be praying for God's wisdom and discernment in those places so that we can be healthy in ourselves. And so over the last season, during this preaching series, we have been learning how to say no. No to destructive powers. No to those who want to abuse. No to those who want to manipulate. And the courage to use that wonderful word, no. And the picture I have uh, in my mind is the authority that we have in the scriptures. That uh, uh, when I was working the old mutual in Johannesburg, I used to catch the bus in and out of town, uh, in and out of work. And uh, I would stand on the side of the road and this bus would come trundling down the hill uh, in, into Linden. Uh, and I would simply put out my hand and this massive double-decker bus would come to a screeching halt for this 20-year-old guy to get onto the bus. And I just think that's the authority that we have, that when the powers and principalities of this dark world come to us, we have the authority in Jesus to say no. And that stops the evil happening. We need to continue to say that. We've also learned that we are custodians of justice. We are not just vague observers of it on a television. We are custodians of that because truth and justice is in our hands. We are, as the church, the voice to the voiceless. We need to speak up. And Lee reminded us so powerfully in that illustration uh, of uh, the movie, As It Is In Heaven, the community has the power 
to have the voice for the voiceless. We also learned that we can use our power for good, not for bad. We overcome evil with good. And so whatever good we do can overturn the principalities and power of darkness. But it's also about listening to the silent ones. It's asking for us to listen very carefully, the scriptures, to zip the lip and use the ears and mouth proportionately to listen twice as much as we speak, because those who are silent have something to say. And we as a church need to create a safe place where those who are silent can speak and we can hear. And then we reminded that God is gender neutral. And in the patriarchal society, we need to be constantly aware of our own language and thinking and phraseology and terminology and practice to be an in inclusive environment. For God is the great includer. So done a bit of wrestling with us here. What does this mean? What does this mean for us to be a church that reveals God's love and mystery? It means we need to have loads of wisdom. That means we have to understand God's way of doing things, that we are able to say we are part of God's healing process. Proverbs 20 verse 9 says, Who can say, I have kept my heart pure? I am clean without sin. Anybody? Hand up. We are all in that place of needing grace. Proverbs 20 11 goes on to say, Even small children, Haley, are known by their actions. So is their contact, conduct really pure and upright? Huh? Even children. And so we have to be in a community that is discerning and seeking God's wisdom and insight daily in every conversation and every engagement. Because we need lots of wisdom and lots of discernment to build trust. But thirdly, we need to let the Holy Spirit flow to produce thriving and wholeness. Thriving and wholeness. Hold on to those two words. Here is Ezekiel. Takes us to the temple and points us to the, the very heart of the temple and uh, sees that the river begins to flow uh, from the center of the temple out in all directions. And so when we are feeling fearful or we're wanting to create safe communities, always focus your minds on God. Look to the source. Look to the source of love and security and the miraculous. Go to God. And that means daily in your devotions. When you wake up in the morning, let your first time be with God to soak your mind and your spirit and your being around the person of God. So go to the source. Secondly, spend time drinking deeply at the river. And that means that the, as the river flows, just go to the river and say, Holy Spirit, help me to be wise in the way I treat much the children. Holy Spirit, help me to be wise in the way I treat my neighbor. Holy Spirit, help me, teach me the way of Jesus. So we drink deeply from the well. And each moment becomes in a moment where we say, God, help me here. Because if I do my way, it could produce more brokenness and more dysfunctionality. But if I seek the way that you do this, I will be wise in my own thinking. So drink deeply from the well. Jehoshaphat's call to the people is pray, pray, pray. Pray without ceasing. Pray. Never stop. Always ask. Boldly, clearly, sincerely, dynamically, silently perhaps. Just in the intimacy of your walk with God in each moment of each day. Be drinking deeply at the well. And then go with the flow. Wherever the river flows that Ezekiel speaks about, that river flows. Just go with the flow. Holy Spirit, where do you want me to go today? Which person do you want me to speak to? Holy Spirit, is there a person that's vulnerable right now? Who, do I need to intervene right now? Do I need, what word can I say that would bring life or protection? What, what do I need to do to let this, your spirit flow through me so that I can be an instrument of healing and wholeness? You see, we're not generators of healing and wholeness. We are just transmitters, as Dallas Willard says. We are conduits of God's healing. Just let that flow through you.
And if that means you putting a hand on a person's shoulder, standing at the call, uh, at the corner of the street, and you see them in need, just pray for them right there. You don't have to be in a church building to do this. You can be in your home, in your workplace, in the gym now, as from Tuesday, or whatever else you, you, need to, you can be. Just be an instrument of hope and love and safety for the people around you. Just let the Spirit flow through you. But also, create safe places. And that's by being a safe person. Because that's when the brackish water of the Dead Sea can be turned into the fresh water of the Sea of Galilee. That's where trees begin to grow and newness comes. So when we are safe people, we create an environment where others can be healed from their own brokennesses, from their own dysfunctionalities. And one of the communities I have appreciated the most, most is Alcoholics Anonymous, where people can be honest and can hold each other so deeply to a life of healing and safety and wholeness. Why? Because they can be truthful, they can be honest, and they can be prayed for into wholeness. Lee and I are part of a small group that meets every Thursday night. And we've been doing this even over Zoom through the last while. And we are aware that that is a safe place for us. It's very powerful. Are we creating safe places for us to grow and to help others to grow? And so Jesus picks up on this, and this is where I end, to say, the Holy Spirit is poured into your hearts. Poured into your hearts. The love of God is poured into your hearts by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is in each of you. Just receive the, the living water that flows into you, and then let that flow through you to places that are broken, places that are brackish, places that are barren, and let there be a thriving. In this season where risk is around us, let us be wise and discerning, but let the community thrive. And so receive the Holy Spirit. Receive the Holy Spirit. How much more then will the Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask? Receive and then be a blessing. Then I wish to share with you as we end, the, uh, I was struck by something that happened uh, in the last little while. And there's a song uh, by Master KG called Jerusalem. Uh, I hope that you uh, get to watch this. But this is a South African who put this together. Uh, this had uh, minor success in South Africa, but then it went to Angola and they made it popular. And now if you can see on the screen, 81 million views. Can you believe this? 81 million views. And so I'm very struck by this because when we think about the particular song, Jerusalem. Now, this particular song, 81 million views, and I hope you're going to add to that today as you go and watch this yourselves. But I was struck that as we uh, watched, uh, watched this thing, they had a challenge. This is a South African song that has gone viral, and people have been challenged to dance this around the world. So I went on to YouTube this week and I have been learning how to dance. Now, you, you can ask my family, I'm a terrible dancer, okay? But I have been learning the steps to Jerusalem. And I hope that you will too, because as we let God's uh, music spill into our hearts, pour into our hearts, we can learn the rhythms and dances as we learn how to let the music flow through us and we are united in song together. And so as I was aware of uh, how God works within us and through us, we are very uh, a part of a big thing that's going on in our world. God is wanting to unite our hearts around one song. It's a song of Jesus, the song of his praise. It's about Jerusalem. And the song's word, you can look up the interpretation. 
this is not my home. Jerusalem is my home. The new heaven, the new Jerusalem is my home. And I want that to lay me, enable me to dance today to the rhythm of God's beat, to the heart that is around God's heart. And so as you call out to God, as you follow God, I invite you to be filled with the Spirit. Come Holy Spirit, come. Come Holy Spirit, come. Come Holy Spirit, come. That we may be safe in you. That we may be safe people and creating safe communities for our world, for your healing, your wholeness, your kingdom. In Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you so much, Chris, for leading us so beautifully through the service. And indeed, we need to learn the dance that will be danced up in heaven. Um, Haley, as well, for, for bringing in that um, wonderful and important uh, aspect of our lives. As you were talking, I was actually thinking, I need to get in touch with you just for my own kids, because almost every computer in this house is now owned by them. All right, friends, we bless each other, as we say, to and with each other. And now, now the grace, grace of, of our Lord, Lord Jesus Christ, Christ, the love of God, God, God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, be with us all. Thank you, friends. Have yourselves a blessed week and God bless you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Thanks all. Have a good week. Same to you.